the future. And so we've tried to make, make a commitment to the women who come to join with us to say to them, we promise you, we will be there for you tomorrow if you will follow the rules of membership in this organization. And the other thing he told me was that women are the backbone of the economy of Haiti, and that's absolutely true, and that's absolutely true in many other third world countries. Um, the women are the ones who are in the informal market, um, selling what they can find wherever they can find it so they can put food on the table at the end of the day. And in Haiti, the informal market of the economy is 70, 75% of the entire economy. So there's hardly much other economy. <coughs> the unemployment rate in Haiti is 85%. I mean, there are no jobs, period. So you are a micro-entrepreneur or you don't live. That's the only way you're going to find a way to live. And most of the women that we deal with, the majority of the women, don't know how to read and write when they join us. And they've been trying to manage their families for years without ever knowing how to read and write. And when I first got there, I can't, it took me months to even get my head around what it meant to not be able to read and write. I was constantly trying to ask myself the question, how would you do this if you didn't know how to read or write? You know, how would you? figure out what to buy at the store, how would you, you know, it just takes a long time to understand the limitations. On the other hand, they have so many skills and so many strengths that I don't even come close to being able to measure up to. They can do calculations in their head that I haven't been able to do for many, many years. <laughs> um, numbers is not a problem for them. They can be illiterate. They don't know what a one looks like or a two looks like, but they know how to calculate one and two and, and 20 and 30. Um, so it was a, and he, and then he also said, that he wanted, I said, what is this bank going to offer? And he talked about credit and he talked about solidarity. He said that living in a country like Haiti, you will not be able to make your way out of poverty if you don't have a concept of solidarity. Uh, he said, um, in the United States, you're so used to all this, these protections you have all around you that no one in Haiti has ever experienced that it's not like Katrina is a very good example, but if there is a hurricane or a flood or something, usually the government is there to, <laughs> to help in some way, you know? If you fall ill, there's, um, you have health insurance, or even if you don't have health insurance, there's places that you can get care. Um, if you, uh, if someone dies in your family, it's not the end of your business. You know, it's just a totally different thing when you're living right on the edge. And so what we believe in Foncoze is that there is a staircase out of poverty, but it's a very, very difficult staircase. And every time you take a step or two forward, inevitably, it is inevitable that there's going to be a step back that you take. Because, if you don't mind me saying so, shit happens. You know, you do lose your mother or you lose your child or there's a hurricane, or there's a thief that comes and steals all your merchandise, or whatever, you know. Stuff happens, and you have to get back up on your feet as quickly as possible and move on to the next uh, thing. And so solidarity is the basis of everything that we do. It is what we're all about. A lot of people ask me, what does Foncoze mean? It's actually an acronym for Fondation Colezepo, and that means the Shoulder to Shoulder Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, solidarity was the key principle that he wanted to communicate to me in that first meeting. And then, and, and then he said, but you know, you can't just give a woman a loan and send her on her way. You have to accompany her as she struggles to make her way out of poverty. And I said, what does it mean to accompany her? And he said, well, she won't know how to read and write. We're going to have to teach her how to read and write. And I said, you mean we're going to be a bank that teaches people how to read and write? <laughs> and he said, we have to be. And he said, we're going to have to teach her how to analyze her business. She doesn't know whether she's making a profit. She doesn't know how to 
it's not that she doesn't know how to do the calculation, it's she doesn't have the concept that there's a difference between her home and her business. It's all one thing for her. She's just trying to keep food on the table for the kids and hope they get to school. So we're going to have to teach her what part of her life is her business and what are the expenses of those business uh, businesses and whether she is making a profit with the month, with what she's doing. And uh, he said there's a whole bunch of life skills. He just said this like this. He just said there's a whole bunch of life skills that they need to have that we're going to have to work with them on. They don't know how to protect themselves, protect their health. We're going to have to teach them how to protect their, their health. And in fact, that's what we have done. Um, it's not just microcredit that we're doing. And some people are saying today that, you know, we all got this whole thing backwards. Really what you should start with is savings, then you should move into insurance, mm -hmm. and then you should move into credit, you know? Mm -hmm. We tend to start at Foncose, we do, people have to open their savings account and begin saving for two months before they can get their first loan to show that they're serious. And they do do that, but it's just now, 11 years later, that we're adding a microinsurance product. But we have to look at ourselves in this room as if we are a center. A center for Foncose is where we have five people in a group that's called a solidarity group, okay? And you pick yourselves, you decide together that you want to be part of the same group. So we're going to make that little group right there, a solidarity group. And then you pick a person who you call the mama of your group. And that person becomes the delegate to Funko Zay's General Assembly. <coughs> so Father Joseph wanted this to be a training ground for democracy. He believed very strongly in this concept that the borrowers were going to manage the institution. And so one of you would be chosen to be the mama of the group. And then six or eight groups, just like we have here, would constitute a center. And in that center, you have um, anywhere from two to four meetings a month. And let's say you're in a center that right now is meeting twice a month. What's going on every time you meet is that you're bringing whatever pennies you have to make a deposit into your savings account. And then you're all talking about the problems you're having in your business. And there's a credit officer there who is there to help with the facilitation. But you have elected a person that you call the center chief. And that center chief is elected from among the mamas of the various groups. So let's say you have uh, six groups in the center. and. Uh, all of the mamas have been elected, and then there's a center chief who gets elected. And that person is there to facilitate the group. And what are we going to talk about this week? What's the topic going to be this week? Is it going to be the fact that the marketplaces where we sell, sell are filthy dirty, and we have raw meat sitting out on the tables with flies covering them? Is it going to be that kind of environmental issue? Or are we going to talk about how hard it is to get our wares from the Dominican Republic over to Haiti and not get robbed on the way? Or are we going to talk about how to get our children in school when our profit margins are so small? And, or are we going to talk about um, the children that are <coughs> sick, that, that you have a child who's very sick, and what are the rest of us going to do to help out because you need to go stay in the hospital with your child and somebody's got to take care of your place in the marketplace. So who's going to sell for you while your child is sick and you can't be selling for yourself? And so those are the kinds of issues that you're talking about. And then at the next meeting, it's the reimbursement meeting, and each of you is bringing the amount of money that you need to bring to make your payment <coughs> on the loan. And then I went to one center meeting where um, that the center had never had a late payment at all. It had been in existence for about three years. No one had ever, ever, ever been late. And there was one woman this day who was late. And the way that's supposed to be handled is that your group is supposed to be aware of that before the day of the center meeting. And you're supposed to sit among yourselves and decide what are we going to do about this. And in some groups, you do have women of bad faith who maybe have 
their husband has taken the money or they have given their money to their husband and it's, they didn't invest it in their business or whatever. And you can decide to get rid of that woman, but you are going to pay for her in, to finish her loan if you want to get another loan yourself. But more often than not, she has a very legitimate reason for being late. And so you're going to talk among yourselves and see if you can figure out a solution to the problem and maybe you can chip in to help her. In this particular case, this particular day, um, they didn't have enough that they could put enough to put to pay her loan, to pay the, her reimbursement that day. And so they brought it to the center meeting. And everyone in the meeting was debating, is this a legitimate reason for her to be not have her money? And she was sitting in the corner with tears coming out of her eyes because her child had been sick for so long. And pretty soon, Everybody put in a little bit, a few pennies, but they still didn't get to the total amount that they needed. The credit agent, meanwhile, is just off by himself. He's not sitting there lecturing to the women, telling them they have to pay, where's the money, blah, blah, blah. He's off letting the women solve the problem. This is a community problem now. It's no longer her problem. It's no longer the group's problem. Now it's the community's problem. What are we going to do? Because we don't want to be late with this payment. So finally, <laughs> this just killed me, how creative they are. So finally one of the women said to the credit agent, get over here. Didn't you ride a motorcycle to this meeting? And he said, yes, I did ride a motorcycle. Well, how much gas did it take you to get here? And he said, I don't know, it took me, a, I don't know how much, let's say 20 cents worth. And she said, well, good, I sell gas. Buy 20 cents worth of gas from me. And, I'll put it in. <laughs> and so that's how they solved the problem, you know? They, they got the credit agent to put in the last 20 cents. So, so um, now if they're meeting four times a week, it means that, I mean, four times a month, it means that they have, because all centers don't have this, but it means they have. We have the financing to provide uh, the educational program to them. And there, it's working like an open university. Let's say there's eight of you who don't know how to read and write. You're going to go into a basic literacy class. And you're going to have one other person in the group, one other person in this group, it, who knows how to read and write. We will have trained her how to become a facilitator of learning for the rest of you. So she's going to go off into one corner and work on the literacy class. Maybe uh, some of the others of you are interested in learning about business skills. You're learning, you want to learn about how to do a business plan, <coughs> a simple business plan, or how to keep an inventory of your merchandise or something like that. Then another person in the group will have agreed to become a facilitator for that class, and she will have been trained. And then you'll go off in another corner, and you'll do the business skills. And then another per and then another class that's being offered is on uh, reproductive health: how to protect yourself against AIDS, how to worry about violence in your home, what to do if your child is raped. You know, how do you deal with these issues? And it's all about discussion and community and leadership building. It's ultimately the whole thing, the structure of having the General Assembly, the structure of being a part of a community is all about developing leadership. Uh, Wendy, um, that's right, w Wendy asked last night about the environmental piece. Well, one of the new modules that we're just re testing right now is about environmental protection. And we all have heard of the Green Belt movement in Kenya and how that just swept the whole country because one woman decided mm -hmm. that we can't let this happen in this country. So people are always saying, how can we create a <coughs> Green Belt movement in Haiti? Well, you can't just create it from the top. Mm -hmm. It's got to start mm -hmm. at the bottom. It's got to start at the grassroots. And so this, in a group like this, you'll all be discussing this issue. And one day, one of you will pop up and say, we can't let this continue to go on in our community like this. Let's take a stand against it. And that's how it will start. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of that. And then we also have a huge problem in Haiti where people have eight children in their home. <coughs> and they can't feed them all. And so a man comes from the city and he says, 
Listen, mm -hmm. I know a family in Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. they, they would like to have one of your children. You can send their children, your child there. They'll get an education. They'll get food every day. What would you do as a parent? Mm -hmm. You're likely to let your child go. And that child becomes a slave and gets no education and is uh, raped by the boys in the family. And it's called a rest of it. And it's a huge, huge problem in Haiti. And because the women who are giving their children up don't know what happens to them. You know, they never see them again. And they don't know that they are not getting an education. So we're bringing that in. But we do all of this through stories. It's, they almost look like comic books. They're painted by Haitian artists. They're illustrations with very simple text. And none of the stories have a conclusion they simply ask a series, they present a dilemma, and then they ask a series of questions, and all of you in the room will discuss the, that. And then you'll do some role playing, just like you did your simulation on microcredit. They do some role playing. They say, you know, okay, you're, gonna, you're the mother, you're the teenage daughter, you're the uncle who slept with the teenage daughter. How are you going to handle this? Because in the end, education is all about learning to communicate mm -hmm. and learning to talk about things that otherwise would remain hidden and that you would push down in your life and not want to even admit exist. So that goes on. But in what I wanted to, the point I was trying to make last night is that Father Joseph has never thought from the beginning that just microcredit alone was going to be enough. It needs to be microcredit combined with savings, combined with uh, remittances, combined with all financial <laughs> services. It needs to be combined with insurance. It needs to be combined with education. It needs to be combined with health care. It's all, it's all, all of those pieces need to be there. And the real issue is how are we going to organize that? And there are multiple ways of organizing it. In the case of education, we decided to do the education as a full part of our program. So it's not separated from, from uh, the credit. But when we decided to do the health care piece, we negotiated a partnership with Paul Farmer and Zami La Sante for him to provide the health care services. And we have other partners because he only works in one section of the country. And so we have other partners that are helping to bring health care to our women. And then when we want to add <coughs> insurance, we found a great insurance company in Haiti run by a young Haitian man who was um, educated in the United States and feels deeply about his country and wants to enter into microinsurance, which is a whole new field for them. So it's about building partnerships. It's about building bridges. It's about doing things yourself. It's about figuring out how to organize this all of these services combined so that people have what they need to make those steps. I wanted to address his, um, I forgot your name already, Marty. Marty. Marty's uh, question about Brock versus Grameen Bank. Mm -hmm. It's not true that we uh, did not accept the Grameen model. We have a Grameen model and we that's what we use as our core solidarity um, core program in our, uh, in our microfinance institution. We had someone from the Grameen Bank come and spend 10 months with us. At that time, we had solidarity groups, but we didn't have centers. And he helped us to implement the center concept in Haiti, and he worked really hard in the field all the time to teach people how to do this center methodology. Because before that, we had credit agents who were running around from solidarity group to solidarity group, and we were getting nowhere fast. And now, if you can service 50 women all with one visit, it's a lot more efficient than trying to go five by five. So he spent a lot of time with us on that. And now we're implementing the village phone program, which is very much a replication of the Grameen phone program. Um, so we very much are doing the Grameen model. The only part where we chose Brock over Grameen was on the issue of the extremely poor person. 
uh, Grameen has a program they call the Struggling Borrowers Program, or the Beggars Program. And they do, they are trying to make microcredit work just with a, Professor Yunus believes no one is too poor to be able to make good use of a loan. And the discussions I've had with him, he really believes that, sincerely believes deeply that he can do that. And so he's giving loans out of the profits from the rest of the bank. He's giving interest-free loans to beggars in the villages. And he doesn't tell them anything they have to do with the money. He doesn't tell them that they have to come to any meetings. They're not part of a solidarity group. They just get a loan. And he says, you can pay me back whenever you want to pay me back. <laughs> but I'd really like it if you would not take the money and use it to feed your family, but rather that you would take it to buy something that while you're selling, you could also, uh, I mean, while you're begging, you could also sell something. Maybe it's just little pieces of candy. So when you go door to door and beg, you could also ask somebody to buy a piece of candy. Um, and he's experimenting with it, and he's clear about that, that it's an experiment. experiment. You know, Professor Yunus is, is still at heart a professor, and he got into this by just taking money out of his pocket and experimenting yeah. to see what was going to happen. So that's what he's doing. Brock, on the other hand, has been working for 10 years with those kinds of beggar women, the people who are really extremely poor. And that's what I was talking about last night. And I do believe that Brock has a richer, more developed model for how to address the very intense um, support that those women need to prepare them to go into microcredit. Um, Professor Yunus wants the beggars to um, have a mentor from a center, okay? So he might take you, and I don't know that he, they ask, actually ask anybody, but they hope someone will take a beggar woman under her wing and that gradually the beggar woman will stop begging for some period of time long enough to start a little business and then that gradually they can merge them into the center. Brock doesn't feel that that works. They feel it's putting too much pressure to put a loan even if you say you don't we don't care when you pay it back. They don't think they're ready to do that. So they provide an intense set of services of training them on how to start an enterprise, and then they actually transfer the asset to the person, transfer the goats or the chickens or whatever, give them to them as a donation. But they have a case manager who <laughs> works with those people, visits them twice a week, every week, and makes sure that, that things are building until they can get them ready for microfinance. Yes? What a question. You know, I was thinking about, um, you know, the failure rate, um, because some people just don't seem to be entrepreneurial. But, you know, I've subscribed to the seven intelligences, now eight intelligences theory, and Harvard sociologists came up with, you know, some people are verbally talented, some are, are mathematically, some are kinetically, musically, artistically, and interpersonally and interpersonally talented. And some, I think, like my daughters, they're all artistic. You know, they're not, well, one is a little entrepreneurial. But you know they they have gifts of creating things, but not necessarily selling things. You know they're not business kind of people. And I'm just thinking that you know I'm like this was just a terrific, fantastic program. That sort of you're 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 drawing, you're you're sort of selecting those that are entrepreneurial, but not to say that these other people can't contribute. You know their skills, even if they. Am I making myself clear? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny issue. Um, for the women that we're talking about as being extremely poor, um, it's not clear. I mean, we can't get to the point of seeing whether they are creative or kinetic or whatever. They, they're just trying <laughs> to get food on the table, you know? I mean, when you're living with hunger and the only option is selling something, then suddenly, you know, we all want to live. 
<coughs> That's a funny thing. You kind of say, why don't they give up? Well, they don't. It doesn't matter how poor they are. They keep trying to do something. So there is an issue in microfinance, which I think is an important one, which is, and Brock is addressing that too, they're creating jobs as well as providing credit for micro entrepreneurs. And I think that's important. And that's why I was talking to Marsha the other yesterday about this, that one of the reasons microcredit is harder in the United States is because we don't have an unemployment rate of 85%. Most mm -hmm. people can get a job of one, in one place or another and do just fine. But if they were starving, they would probably find a way to be micro entrepreneur would be to be entrepreneurial. Yes. My question is, eighty five percent unemployment, these women have nothing to start with. They're going out and selling things, but who's buying it? it yeah. <laughs> you're talking about a situation where <coughs> everybody has this this question, but the point is is that they're going one place and bringing back to that village the only things there are for people to survive on. So they walk long, long distances or they take very unsafe trucks to get to wherever they go to buy what they're buying. And if they didn't buy, bring back the rice or the beans or whatever that they are then going to sell, there would be no rice and beans in that community. They are the distribution network. Coca-Cola has trucks that brings Cokes everywhere in our country. There's no distribution network like that in Haiti. There's nobody making sure that there's a place to buy food in the community except these women. They're the ones that are doing it. So here's how it works. You have a bakery. My son was there for a couple of years and he opened a bakery in the rural countryside. And the bakery only sells to Tima Shan. Okay? And so to these market women. And so they come and they buy dozens of loaves of bread. And then they take those, that bread, to a marketplace. And they sell it to someone who has walked six hours to purchase it. And that person purchases a dozen loaves. And that person takes it back to her home community. And then she sells a loaf at a time. And that there, another person who has walked another eight hours buys it, takes one loaf back, cuts it up, and spreads some peanut butter on it, and mm -hmm. finally somebody eats it, you know? But it's the only way that <coughs> the food gets out to where the people are. And I don't mean just food, I mean clothes or whatever. Most of the clothes that people in Haiti are wearing are hand handoffs from the United States. But people are selling those clothes along the way. That's how they make their living. And um, so everything that gets to these isolated rural communities gets there only through somebody bringing it there. So everyone is doing that. And so there is some cash flow through the community. Okay, I'm selling the bread. You, you could do it without money. You know, you don't, in, a fa in a manner of speaking, you're just bartering, you know, at the, in the final analysis. But you have to have money to take with you to walk the next day so you can buy whatever it is that you're going to sell. Um, but, but that's what it is all about. There's no other distribution network in Haiti. There's no way to get goods out to these rural areas except for women to buy them and carry them. Yeah. Well, so what's the violence that's happening there right now? Well, right now, it's relatively uh, stable compared to the way it was in the past. Um, the, it, the whole thing was mixed up in politics and Aristide and, you know, all mm -hmm. of that. But right now, it's pretty stable, and the kidnappings are way down, and the violence in the streets is much better. But one thing that you need to understand is, is Haiti It has 8 million people, and it's really two countries. There's Port-au-Prince that has a government. And then there's the countryside, and there's about two million people living in Port-au-Prince, and everybody else is in the countryside. So <laughs> way more people in the countryside, and they have no government services. You know, so what's going on in Port-au-Prince 
says nothing about what's going on in the countryside. So when you read about the violence in Haiti, you're reading about what's going on in Port-au-Prince. Do but they carry submachine guns around all the time? Like yeah, we saw the UN forces there. They do in El Salvador, they're standing yeah. in front of the ice cream yeah. shops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But not so much in the, in the countryside. They don't have any grocery <laughs> stores. In the, but in Port-au-Prince, yes, there's guns everywhere. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah. But we still have the UN troops there with, uh -huh. you know. But oh, when you go there, so I don't want you to give up the idea of going there because of these guys. You felt, I felt, and our whole group felt very safe the whole time. From the time we got out of the plane in Port-au-Prince, uh, someone met us there in a van from Anne's, and we were with um, people who knew the language and who took very good care of us. So really, I had no um, feelings of, um, you know, that someone was going to shoot me or... <laughs> I don't know. That's because we're American. No, yeah. but, you know... Uh, uh, I, no, no, I thought it was me, uh, <laughs> yeah. that all the white people call Blancs over there, and the Blancs are not the ones that are kidnapped. It is the Haitians mm -hmm. who come back to their country to try to do something for mm -hmm. them. Because they have the money, but mm -hmm. the other Haitians really know their families. Now, what if she just told me that? She made me feel better. <laughs> but I, yeah. she seemed very sure of that. Of course, she does have a armed bodyguard, and she does live in a house with a barbed wire fence all around it. And That's in Port of Prince. In Port of Prince. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. up in the hills. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, but I want to talk about, you know, how all the different ways that people can contribute and can really participate in this. Um, when I first went to Haiti, all I wanted to do, the main motivation I had for going there was to figure out how in the world do these people, are the, is there so much hope in this country with so, so much poverty? Why is it that they're all welcoming me into their country when I'm part of their problem? And, and why is it that there's so much hope in their eyes? And they are the leaders, as Mary said. They are the people who are leading me it's not me leading them. It's and I hate it when people say that I'm helping them. Mm -hmm. I'm participating with them in their struggle, and all of you can participate in your own way if you are so moved to do so. Um, there are a lot of people. I mean, what Maureen is talking about is not a dream. We most of the branches. We have 32 branches now, and most of those branches were given to us by a church in the United States, or by a group of people, or by a single individual. They, basically it costs fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to pay the operating costs of a branch for the first year and a half, something like that, until we can get enough loans out there that it uh, becomes sustainable. Okay, they're not, it's a one-time, one-shot deal, and then you know you're the founder of that branch, and that goes on uh, forever, but you never have to give more money to it. Um, there are other people in the United States, for instance, we have a group of people in Tulsa who um, gave us an interest-free $500,000 loan, and that's what we use for the loan capital. So as Maureen said, you pay the operating cost, <coughs> and we put in, let's say, 100000 into that branch, to start giving out the loans. And then over the course of a year or two years, that 100000 is replaced by the savings that the people in the community are putting into their savings accounts. So then we can take the 100000 we put in and move it to another place. Mm -hmm. And then they're borrowing from the, the savings in the community. And so you have a little economic uh, zone that is creating wealth for itself, and that is how you build economically. And then, as Maureen said, it's $25 a person for one of these four-month modules. The cost to us is the cost of letting all of the borrowers, we have to train them to become facilitators of these courses, and that's where our cost is, is in uh, bringing them all together in one place, the ones who volunteer, you know, you say you want to uh, teach business skills, you say you want to do reproductive health, you say you're willing to do the literacy, and then we have to bring you all together with other people from other centers and help you learn how to do that. 
and the um, so then to put the literacy into the branches because we were growing nicely now. We had a period where we had totally cut back on the education because we couldn't mm -hmm. keep up with the growth in the borrowers. There was a time when we would say to people, you have a right to have the education you need to learn how to read and write. You also have the responsibility to learn how to read and write. If you're going to live in a democracy, you need to know how to read and write. So it's your right, but it's also your responsibility to participate. That was a great line. I loved it. But then we couldn't get enough funding to do that for everybody. That's when we had 10,000 clients or 15,000 clients, and then suddenly we had 40,000 clients, and we couldn't pay for everybody. So we had to stop saying that. And now we've been rebuilding, and uh, so our educational program is offered in most of our branches now, but not all. So we still need people who can contribute even $25 to help one person go through um, school, to go through these classes. Um, the, we now have um, both a foundation, which is the core institution uh, that we started with, and it is uh, a nonprofit foundation, but we also have a commercial entity. Most microfinance institutions today are moving to this model because over the long haul you do need investment capital to get to the scale you need to go to. For those of you who were with us last night, the issue here is scale. I can reach 5,000 without much trouble, I can reach 10,000, I can reach 50,000, but if I'm going to reach 200,000 or 300,000 so that one in eight families can have access to credit I need a lot more investment capital, and it's going to be a lot easier to get that by giving a return to investors, whether they're investors from the United States or investors from Haiti or, where, or from Europe or wherever. So the commercial entity has um, about 30, total of 30 uh, investors, and those investors include religious communities all over the United States, female religious communities, actually purchase <laughs> equity in our branch, and our uh, commercial entity. We have foundations that have stock in it, and we have individuals who purchase shares of stock in it, and uh, we have uh, some big investors from uh, the Netherlands who are in it. But the foundation is the biggest investor. We own about half of the shares of stock in that entity. It's never been profitable yet. It's been around now for two and a half years. It's not yet profitable. Well, it is profitable this year. It's just now beginning to break a profit. But once it begins to be profitable, and now we have all kinds of investors who are interested in coming in and, and helping to make this thing grow because they see that we've kind of gotten where we need to be. But we always are looking for people who want to come to Haiti. You can come as part of a delegation, like Maureen did, and that's great. Because look at all the work Maureen's done since she got back to get all of you here today. You know, that's just incredible to me. And so every person that comes becomes someone who helps this whole thing grow for us back here in the States. One of the people that was on her um, delegation has a little family foundation himself, and he put up 25000 as a matching grant so that he could raise the money to open a branch, and they finished. You, you're a beast. <laughs> <laughs> he was my competitor the whole way. We were both taking notes of him. Yeah. But he had the head start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's possible. So. There's so many different entry points. We've also had tremendous success over the years just with people who offer their services to us. We've had pro bono law firms. We have marketing companies that help us. We have, um, uh, we have investment bankers in, in, on Wall Street who have worked with us to help us develop business plans or whatever. So 
We have the Grand Mean Foundation, who provides a tremendous amount of assistance to us, a tremendous amount of technical assistance, and which Habitat is just great. And Habitat for Humanity is a partner, aren't they? Huh? Some, isn't Habitat for Humanity? Yeah, Habitat yeah, for Humanity. About Kai. Yeah, Credit Kai is the, last night I was showing the pictures, Credit, you know, we only give business loans, but then we realize that if our clients were really going to be able to make their way out of poverty, it's kind of difficult to do it if you're living in a dirt floor and you have a thatched roof for your roof. I mean, chances are your kids are going to get sick a lot. You know, living on a dirt floor is not a good way to live, uh, especially when there are torrential rains and you're living on a mud floor and you have a thatched roof that leaks. It just doesn't work very well, you know? And you have no sanitation facility. You have no latrine, you know, no out, not to even talk about a toilet, but you have no latrine even. That's not a healthy environment for people to be trying to grow their families, and not grow in terms of numbers, but develop their families. And so we made a partnership with Habitat for Humanity to give, to not build homes, because these people are way too poor to pay for building a home, but to just give them enough of an additional loan to cement their floor mm -hmm. and to change the thatched roof from a, to a tin roof and to dig a latrine. Even if 10 families in the community use the same latrine, that is worlds better than people having no sanitation facilities whatsoever. It's really terrible for children to live in that kind of environment. So they do that. But the conflict that we have here is that they have a business loan. And you can't take away the business loan or then they'd have no business at all. You know, So they need the business loan for the working capital. But then you give them another loan on top of that. It's a tough thing. It's mm -hmm. tough for but them. But they do it. it. They do it. <laughs> they mean, start repaying. And what I love is this one person, we went into their, their, I showed it last night, the picture of their house. We went in there and told her that, you know, asked her if she wouldn't like a roof. And she said she would love a roof. And so we set out, to, took the measurements and everything for the roof. And before we knew it, she and her husband had run around and collected all this wood. And they built a brand new house. You know, and they said, if you're going to, if you're going to give us the loan for a roof, we'll just go ahead and build a house. And so they built the house themselves. And then we put on a nice tin roof for them. And um, now they have a really nice house. I mean, you know, it's still a one room house, but they have a house. Um, so that's the way we're doing it. So we're putting together the the credit, the housing, the health, the education, life the life insurance now, all of that is part of a package and uh, gradually what we're trying to do is say to our clients that if you will come work with us, follow the rules, stick with us for five years, we can give you a commitment that at the end of that period of time, you will know how to read and write, your children will all be in school, you will have food on your table every day of the week, you will um, have a, dirt, a cement floor, a tin roof, and a latrine, and you will have the confidence to face your future. That's a big promise, but it's one that we feel that we have the ability now to do if the person, the, the person is the one doing the struggle. Don't ever, ever, ever think that any of this is easy. You know, For that person who's the recipient of this, they still have to do the struggle. And they have to be really committed to that. Yes, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, is it all? Do you make loans just to women or to men or to couples or how? We do for our, um, you know, we try to meet people wherever they are on that staircase out of poverty that I talked to you about. Mm -hmm. And so for the women who have <coughs> nothing at all and their first loan is going to be a $20 loan, they don't have a business yet but they have an idea of what they want to do and we give them 20 bucks to get started, um, that's only women. Then the ones in our core solidarity group program, that's only women. But after that, we have an individual loan program 
and we give those loans to graduates of solidarity lending, but also to micro entrepreneurs in the countryside, and they can be men or women or couples. And I would say it's about a third, a third, a third. A third of them are couples, husbands and wives working together in a business. A third of them are women, and a third of them are men. Um, so we do give loans to men, but not until, for the kind of solidarity lending, it doesn't work well with men. It just doesn't do very well. Um, I have just one more question. Yeah. That is, I'm thinking of Zimbabwe. Uh -huh. They are, you know, in so much the same. Yes. Uh -huh. people. Much of Africa is very similar to. Um, is, um, how do you, has, has any other country or groups approached you going to their own, to another place? Have you thought about, say, for Funko Zimbabwe? Right. No, we've thought about the Dominican Republic, but that's as far as we okay. <laughs> We still have a lot to do in Haiti, but, yeah. so we want to get as far as we can in Haiti. But eventually, yes, I, I think the model of what we've been doing is working pretty well. But you know who is doing that, who's a really good friend of ours, is Promuher. And they started in Bolivia, and now they're in Nicaragua and Mexico and Peru, I think, something like that. Um, yes, Marcia? Um, you know, maybe this isn't even an issue because the need is so great, but do you think, um, does traditional charity um, um, kind of s cause a problem? Absolutely. For your model? Absolutely. I mean, we feel <laughs> really, really strongly. When I first got to Haiti, I said, this is the most amazing place I've ever been. It looks to me like the country is ready to either become a total culture of dependence, where everybody sits around and waits for somebody to do something for them, or a culture of independence, where people are just want, because it, it just wasn't like being in the United States, where there is that kind of welfare mentality in a lot of places. In Haiti, people want to work, wanted to work. But there are increasing numbers of people in Haiti. I feel like there really is a window of opportunity that is gradually shutting because the United States is just so effective at creating cultures of dependence. Mm -hmm. It's what they want, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, not they, it's me, us, you, me. Mm -hmm. But that's our foreign policy. That's what we do is create dependence, mm -hmm. dependencies in people. And it's a huge struggle. And a whole community can be spoiled because somebody has come in there and given away free food. Mm -hmm. We had a, when we had one, uh, when the, um, the former military came across the Dominican border and, um, you know, there was this violence and then Aristide left and everything. And in the part of, one part of the country where we were working, um, people were going around saying that, you know, we need an immediate relief effort. We need to go in and bring food to the people. Well, what was really happening was the economic chain had been broken because people couldn't go to Port-au-Prince and buy their wares. And because a lot of times the little boutiques in the countryside will sell on credit and they couldn't get to... Anyway, it broke the economic chain. But if you had come in there and passed out free food, not only would you have created dependencies in those people, but those entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. had been supplying mm -hmm. food to the community would be wiped out, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So instead, we went in and gave loans to the, the people who were selling to the Timashan so they could get back into getting, you know, their, uh, the, the wholesale merchandise out to further out in the countryside. It's a very complicated problem, mm -hmm. but I really dislike the... Um, there are times when relief work is absolutely essential. I don't mean to say that. But you have to be so careful about what the impact is going to be when you do that. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, she, she wanted to ask I just something. wanted to ask real quickly, the new insurance component, is it just life insurance? What it is, is um, it's going, in Haiti there is no insurance, okay, for poor people. So we want to start very, very small and build gradually. So it starts off, it pays the balance of your loan and gives you a death benefit that's not even enough to pay for a funeral, but it's something. And we want the people to begin to trust that we'll be there. 
because what happens is there's so many scams in Haiti. So the idea is if we can convince them that the day you have somebody die, we will give you the death benefit because our director can, in the branch, can verify that the person really died rather than waiting for a death certificate, which will never come. You know, we just have to start little by little and build their confidence. But the idea is that we would gradually add on other kinds of insurance, ultimately, hopefully, health insurance. But it's hard to add on health insurance until you have health care providers everywhere. <laughs> <laughs>